Um, chapters five and six deal with uh, the issue of forecasting futures prices. And primarily, uh, they relate to the role of speculators. As you know, uh, speculators are an important component of any successful futures contract. Without speculators, we wouldn't have active futures contracts. Um, so chapter five is devoted to one school of thought, and chapter six devoted to the second. And uh, during the stock track trading game, uh, you're playing the role of a speculator. And I imagine that most of you are using fundamental analysis, but it's fine if you're using technical analysis as well. So uh, five, as I say, focuses on fundamental analysis. A fundamentalist uh, looks at economic information. Uh, they look at supply and demand factors. Uh, they try and determine the intrinsic value of an asset or a commodity. What is the true value of the price of gold based on supply and demand factors? What's the true value of a pound of cotton based on supply and demand factors? So you have to look at production. You have to look at consumption. You have to look at the role of government policy, uh, the influence of weather. For example, in the heating oil market today, that market is very sensitive to weather forecasts for the coming winter. And that's a fundamental uh, factor. It has to do with supply and demand. Cold winter, large demand, up goes the price of heating oil. So a fundamental trader is trying to look at the probability of a price move. What is the chance that the price of bonds are going down this week uh, because of the open market meeting tomorrow? Have any of you read about the Fed meeting, upcoming meeting tomorrow? It's an important event in the financial markets should pay attention to it. There was a big story in the Wall Street Journal this morning on the Fed open market uh, here, uh, meeting. Uh, these are held on a regular basis. And uh, as you know, they've kept the, the short-term interest rates, they've kept dropping them for the last two years. Uh, they've been maintained at a level that's uh, lower than we've seen in 45 years. It's 1% on the short-term rate, which is the Fed um, rate that's controlled by the Fed, I should say. And this is the rate that banks lend to one another for overnight deposits. So they have these meetings where they try and determine whether they should change the rate. And it has to do with trying to steer our economy down a path of growth. And uh, we heard Mr. Snow's comment last week that he expects the economy to grow. And uh, therefore, interest rates will probably rise. At the last uh, Fed meeting, which was in, um, I think it was June or July, uh, Alan Greenspan, the chairman of the Fed, came out with a statement saying uh, uh, short-term rates will stay low for a long time, which is a significant statement. When uh, Mr. Greenspan leaves his condo tomorrow morning, I, I guarantee the uh, cameras will be there and watching for body language to see if, if it looks like he's in an aggressive mood or whatever. Uh, this is extremely important for the financial market. And according to the article in the Wall Street Journal this morning, uh, there's really no expectation that they will change the rate tomorrow. Okay, so if the rate is changed tomorrow, that's a huge surprise in the market. Uh, but what they are looking for tomorrow are the words that come out of the meeting. Okay, Snow is saying, well, rates are probably going to rise. Greenspan said rates aren't going to rise for a long time. Will he change his story? Will it become consistent with Snow's? And uh, that will have an impact on uh, the financial market if that story changes. Uh, so that's all fundamental analysis. So if I were a fundamental trader, I'd be reading up on that. I'd get up early in the morning and try and see what sort of mood Greenspan's in tomorrow um, and anticipate a movement in the financial markets and position myself accordingly. If I were a technician, I could sleep in. I wouldn't care whether Greenspan was in a good or bad mood. I wouldn't care what Greenspan has to say or what people are speculating he might say. Uh, I don't care about Mr. Snow. All that I focus on is historical price behavior as a technician. Technical analysis is inherited from the stock market where there's a long history of charting prices. Uh, 
in the days prior to the personal computer, which you all don't remember, but I do, uh, people would literally sit and chart prices by hand with a big sheet of paper. Many years ago, when I used to visit the futures exchanges up in the viewer's gallery, the, there was a, a gentleman sitting up there in a lawn chair, and as the prices came up on the chalkboard, I didn't even have electronic boards, he would chart them on his piece of paper. He was a technician looking for price patterns. Technicians look for recurring price patterns, and they try and <coughs> forecast prices based on historical price behavior. So for the most part, technicians will only look at where the market has been. And they think they can forecast where the market's going based on where it's been. So it's a completely different philosophy. The technicians implicitly assume that the market is not efficient because if it was efficient in a strong sense of the word, then history doesn't matter. What's happened has happened. It doesn't really matter what happened in the bond market last week. What happens is news today, news tomorrow, which would throw technical analysis out the window. So there's this implicit uh, conflict between these two schools of thought. But like in any good market, we have a large number of traders who follow the fundamental approach and those that follow the technical approach. Most brokers will use technical analysis because it's much easier. Right? Using technical analysis, you can be an expert in 30 different markets at one time because you can use your same technique, which is basically looking at a chart. You know, I'm simplifying it a little bit, and it's all done with computers now, but you look at a chart and you try and say, yes, I've seen this pattern before. The market this week is going higher or it's going lower, and identifying uh, trends and changes in those trends. That's what they do, and you don't care if you're looking at coffee or lumber or cattle. It doesn't really matter. It's just a chart with prices, and you believe that these markets fall, follow recurring patterns, whereas a fundamental trader must know a lot about a particular market, as you're discovering with stock track. You have to become an expert on who produces the product, who consumes it, uh, and what uh, government policies impact that market, and so on. So a technician studies the market itself, ignores supply and demand because they just focus on prices and price charts for that matter. Yes? The question is, do either of these methods actually work? Which is a very good question. <laughs> um, I guess uh, personally, I, I really don't uh, put much faith in technical analysis um, because I have studied these approaches and in my opinion you will not make money over long periods of time following technical approaches. Why is that? Because the markets are quite efficient. They're not completely efficient but they're highly efficient. Uh, and it just to me conceptually doesn't make sense that uh, you can predict the future based on past price behavior. That's not to say there aren't a lot of technicians out there. And uh, I'll show you a video on Wednesday of a very successful technician. But he makes most of his money selling videotapes and selling books, not trading. Okay? So there are a lot of individuals that will uh, buy into technical approaches. Um, and if they get lucky, they might make some money. But if they stay with it for long enough, uh, in my opinion, they'll, they will lose. Basically, a technician is looking for a trend in the market, and if you get in on a trend, as you know, you can make some money. But if it's a choppy market or it turns on you, it just doesn't work. So there are a lot of technicians out there. There are millions of books that you can buy. You know, There's probably 20 books published in the last two years on the gold market, and they're all following technical approaches. There's a, there's a market for technical approaches because it can be conveyed as being a simple way to trade. Uh, you don't have to know anything about the futures market, and they can promise very high rates of return based on some historical performance. Uh, but I could bring in a series of charts into this classroom, and uh, I could pull up a chart, 
and say, well, you know, if you had followed my approach, you would have gone long on this particular date and uh, look how much money you would have made, right? And it's very easy. You don't have to know anything about anything. Just listen to my method. Send me $3,000 and I'll give you a videotape and um, hopefully I'll never see you again, <laughs> okay? Uh, so there's lots of that in the marketplace because there are a lot of individuals who don't understand futures markets. They like the idea of earning 300% a year on their money and uh, it's quick money, it's easy to do, you know, according to these professional traders. And um, so there are a lot of individuals who come in, try the system, lose money, they leave. You may not hear from them again or maybe in 10 years they'll come and try it again. Um, so that's sort of the technical side. But in addition to that, there are a lot of um, commodity funds now. I call them commodity funds, but they're also trading financial assets. They're, they're very similar to mutual funds. Uh, but they trade uh, futures and options contracts. And so they're trading managed money. And there are investors who don't have the expertise on futures. They like the uh, risk return trade off. Basically, with futures and options, high potential return. It's also high risk, but high potential return. And especially if the bond market or the, the equity market is boring, they might put some money into futures. One way to do it is to invest in one of these uh, funds. And most of the funds will follow technical approaches because they have to uh, reveal to their investors their trading strategy. And the best way to do that is to adopt a technical approach. You can write that down and say, this is the strategy I follow. And then the computers do all the work. The computers decide when you go long and short and so on. So those funds uh, also follow the technical approach. Um, it does it work um, for some people for short periods of time? It works. Um, fundamental analysis, that applies to more of the professional traders, those that have been at it for many, many years, and they'll focus on one or two or three contracts. Um, I've known lots of traders that were very rich and now they're driving a tow truck. So that happens as well. It's not a sure thing. Um, but I guess I believe in economics, otherwise I wouldn't be doing the job I'm doing. Uh, these markets are important economic institutions. They respond to fundamentals. Eventually, the market's going to reflect the fundamentals, supply and demand factors. And there are short-term aberrations, and so I'm a fundamentalist. The, the market is, is quite efficient. If uh, I guess if all the technicians and all the fundamentalists believed that the market was fully efficient, then they would never bother investing in this market. You would never find a speculator interested in the futures market if they were convinced it was fully efficient. So thank goodness they believe it's not efficient. They invest, and as a result, they drive it closer to efficiency because they have different expectations and the fundamentalists will spend a lot of time researching the markets and uh, as a result it's driven closer to efficiency. So I'll come back to your question, but it's, uh, it's not an easy question to answer. Some speculators make money. Some speculators make lots of money. But most speculators lose money. Right? I think I mentioned that in week one. 80% of the speculators lose money, something like that. So conceptually, what uh, sort of defines a te technical trader versus a fundamentalist? Well, conceptually, there's an important um, statistical relationship called uh, the theory of random walk. And it's a s simplified version of some other uh, statistical relationships. But basically, it's a theory that describes how a stochastic price will move through time, right? We have the price of cotton. How does that move through time? Uh, we have the price of T-bonds. How does that move through time? We could describe that using a statistical approach. And there's one called the theory of random walk that uh, basically says when you look at day-to-day -day price changes, so the closing price today in the cotton market versus Friday's close, 
that will be a random variable. Uh, the ex expected value is zero, and uh, we'll have positive moves and negative moves, but on average, it's zero. In other words, in the markets, you can't forecast forthcoming prices based on past prices because price changes are random. So there's no way that technical analysis works if you believe in the theory of random walks. Okay? So this uh, goes against the grain of technical analysis. So what the theory says is that the price today, so you can think of that as a closing price today, P sub T, is equal to the price yesterday, we're Monday, so that would have been Friday's price, plus an error term, okay? And the expected error term is zero. The expected error term is zero. So if we bring uh, the previous price over to the left-hand side, bring it over here, and we take the expectation, then the expected price change between the price, the closing price today and the close, closing price last period, E of PT minus PT minus 1 is equal to the error term, and we know that the expected error term is zero. So that's what the theory of random walk is. When I was a college student, we had a roommate, and we nicknamed this person Random Walk. Now, why do you suppose we gave him that name? He was unpredictable, right? You couldn't predict behavior based on past behavior. It was totally random. And that's how these markets work for the most part. Just because the stock market was down last week doesn't mean it's going to be down this week. That's past. That's history. So the theory of random walk says the reason the market was up today, which it was, and it was down last week, was that some new information came in the market that was positive, that was bullish, and it brought the market up. It had to do with some corporate earnings. And we couldn't have predicted that last week because we didn't know what these earnings were going to say. The news came in, the market's up. And clearly, if we had been counting on that trend from last week, it wouldn't have worked. So that really um, takes the steam out of any argument that technical analysis can be profitable because if the markets do follow a random walk, if prices, price changes do average to zero, then it's very hard to beat the market with a technical trading rule because all the technical trading rules assume the contrary, that there's some correlation in prices. So what happened last week is an indication of what's going to happen this week. The random walk theory says that's not the case. So this gets around to, uh, to your question about whether these systems work, and it all has a lot to do with efficient markets. And it's, I know that this is a sort of a fuzzy concept, uh, because we do consider these markets to be highly competitive, highly efficient. Uh, and if that were the case, then you're right. Fundamental trading would be wor just as worthless as, as technical trading. Um, and we wouldn't have the markets. But we do. We do have traders in both groups. And what that tells me is that the markets are not totally efficient. You can make some money trading if you spend some time investing, understanding a market. It's possible to make some money in this industry, um, which suggests that they're partially efficient. But if there's a, a profit opportunity, it soon gets spit away, uh, largely because we have all these technicians or fundamentalists. So if the market starts to move upward, then the technicians will come in because all their models kick in and they say buy. And if all the models say buy, well then they all buy, and guess what? The market rises because in the futures market, every dollar is a vote. If a large number of traders think the market's going up, it will go up. So in all likelihood, it probably overshoots as well. That's another 
possibility, another theory of how these prices behave, is they might overshoot their equilibrium, they might overshoot their intrinsic value because of the role of technicians. And so there's some controversy with regard to these uh, futures funds that are trading billions of dollars in the market, all following fairly similar technical rules, they all tend to swing from one side of the market at the same time, and this causes some overshooting, which is just an entree for the fundamental traders to take advantage of that as well. Yes, the price of cattle should have gone up, but they've gone up too much based on the fundamentals, so it's time to short the market. That's what a fundamentalist would say. So um, I think in reality the markets are highly efficient but not fully efficient, and there are different concepts of efficiency. Uh, the, the weakest form of efficiency simply says that the market reflects all uh, the information that's, that's public and is, has already been reported in the newspaper. So if we already know that um, there's going to be a crop failure in China and that's not reflected in the wheat market yet, then that market's not very efficient because this is information's been out there for a week, it's pretty well known, but the market hasn't reacted. And if the information is valid, then that, that's not an efficient market. And that's the, the weakest test of efficiency. Sort of another test of efficiency is that the market reflects all that past information plus all public information with regarding to forthcoming changes in supply and demand. And that's a little harder to achieve as a marketplace. And then the strongest form would say it reflects all private information as well. So when we talk about efficiency, there's actually different levels of efficiency. And the futures market can meet the lowest level of efficiency but not the higher levels, which again is an entree for uh, some profitable trading on behalf of fundamentalists. So how do you beat the market? Um, well. I don't make my living selling videos, um, so I'll just have to give you uh, an opinion here. Um, basically, everybody has access to more or less the same information today. It's not as though there's a lot of inside information. So first of all, the futures market is different than the stock market, where in a stock market there really is inside information, right? If you're working for um, uh, an investment bank, you'd have prior information about a leveraged buyout, right? And if you're Martha Stewart and your friend happens to own the company, uh, then you could have inside information as to a public statement that the company is making. But that's rarely the case in the futures markets, okay? I doubt if Alan Greenspan phones his son-in-law the night before the open market meeting and chats about what he might say the next day. If he did, that would be inside information. I sort of doubt it. Um, and in these markets, it's, it's largely reflecting supply and demand information, the weather, political events in the Middle East, uncertainty with regard to production or consumption in many different parts of the world. And who has inside information on that? We're pretty good at predicting the weather a day or two out, but beyond that, forget it. I mean, we have no idea if we're heading into a cold winter or not. And if somebody had inside information on whether or not this winter is going to be cold, you could make a fortune on the heating oil market, but it just doesn't exist, right? So not even Martha Stewart would have access to that information. So in the, in the futures market, this whole business of trading based on inside information is much less of a problem. So everybody has more or less the same information set. So as a trader, you either have to use that information that's available in a different way or, or interpret it more accurately. And uh, there's also a lot of non-informational aspects in the market that you, that you must anticipate as a trader. Um, so this gets around us to an interesting question. 
because there is a lot of information available. One reason that uh, technicians will shun fundamental trading, and if you go into most brokerage firms and you start talking fundamentals, you know, forget it. Um, I suspect some of you are technicians because you don't seem that interested in the fundamentals, but um, the fundamentals will ultimately prevail in the marketplace. But it's not to say that there aren't problems because uh, one of the problems is there's simply too much information. If you tried to read all the information that's available on the world soybean market, I mean, you could literally spend full time trying to keep current, so there's almost too much. And some, in some cases, um, it's hard to say what a fact is because something might be reported in the newspaper, but it doesn't mean it's true. I'll just give you some examples. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture releases quarterly reports on certain commodities, and they have something called the hog and pig report. And this is based on quarterly surveys of pig farmers where they ask them all these questions and then they tabulate the results and they release a report under very secret conditions. So after the market's closed on a Friday, they'll release this report. So there's a, there's a bit of a, a problem here because they're asking these farmers questions like, how many pigs were born on your farm compared to a year ago? And if you think about it as a farmer and you tell them that you're increasing your supply, you know, what's that going to do to the price, right? So there's a bit of a problem uh, associated with getting accurate information. Uh, but they do their best and work with the best statisticians to get around these types of issues. Um, but nevertheless, they spend a lot of money producing these reports. But there are some odd things with the hog and pig report. Uh, for example, it's not unusual for the, the hog market to react to the report as though it's a total surprise, which for the life of me I've still yet to understand even though I've studied this because growing hogs is a biological process. It's not like trying to forecast the price of heating oil that depends on the weather. Uh, the hog supply doesn't depend on whether there's peace in the Middle East. There's all these other factors that we don't have to worry about if we know how many hogs we start with, we should be able to figure out uh, what the forthcoming supply is. But for some reason, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the hog market trying to assess the true supply and demand. And a number of years ago, the government forecast a large increase in the number of um, farrowings, a large increase in the number of expected births of hogs, so we expected about a 7% increase in the supply of hogs. It takes about six months to produce the hog. Well, it turns out those hogs never did show up. Okay? Now, they may still be running around the Midwest somewhere, but they never showed up at the market. So that's just an example that you can't fully trust the hog and pig report because it's not totally accurate. Um, and there are a lot of other USDA crop forecasts that um, Sometimes it turns out that they missed the mark by a wide margin, even though they spend a lot of money doing them. Uh, there's the famous uh, orange juice market, the FCOJ, the frozen concentrated orange juice market. As I mentioned before, that depends on weather factors in Florida in January and also um, weather in Brazil in, in our summer, their winter. So in the month of January, this market is always uh, trying to assess the weather patterns in Florida. And in futures markets lore, there's this story about some airline pilot 20 years ago who made a bundle in the FCOJ market because they were uh, boarding their flight in Los Angeles and they looked at the weather map before their departure and they noticed a huge cold front heading for Florida. And uh, so they held up the plane, called a broker, put in orders, and uh, there were six or seven of them, and took large positions. Sure enough, it froze that night in Florida, and they made a fortune. Uh, probably true. It's a good story anyway. Um, 
Now, you couldn't do that today because everybody has access to weather information today with our computers and the internet. In those days, I mean, it was difficult to access that real-time information on the weather, and we spent a lot of time making sure the pilots had it because that was important. But um, it was really the pilots that had a corner on that, that market on the weather. Um, and then um, an economist came along and had a look at this orange juice market. His name was Richard Rowe and said, well, that's very interesting. Um, I'm also interested in the weather in Florida because I have a condo there. And uh, when I get up in the morning, I want to know whether it's going to freeze that night because if it is, I'm going to have to cover my flowers, right? So there's two choices. A, I can look at the National Weather Service and see what their forecast is. Or B, I can check what the futures market is doing today and whether the market believes it's going to freeze. So he did this very sophisticated statistical analysis covering a large number of years, and he asked the very interesting question, which is the better predictor of a frost in Florida on a given January day? Is it A, the National Weather Service, or B, the futures market? Guess what he found? Futures market, absolutely. The futures market did a better job than the National Weather Service so this is after the pilot thing, right? So uh, the market is pretty darn efficient. It does a better job of reflecting the fundamental information on weather patterns than the National Weather Service does because all the traders that are sitting at their desk are trying to assess the probability of a freeze. And if their information says it's going to freeze, well, they, they buy juice contracts and drive the price up. And uh, for those of you not in the market, all you have to do is look at market behavior, and it tells you something. Um, so it's hard to say what a fact is, which complicates life. Um, I mentioned that the amount of data is simply overwhelming. And as we discussed, uh, as facts do emerge, it's quickly discounted in the price. As Mr. Roll found out, uh, factual information regarding the weather is quickly discounted in the price uh, more rapidly than the National Weather Service uh, can possibly uh, adjust to. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between a hog and a pig? Uh, this, the weight. The weight. A hog's a big pig. Yeah. <laughs> Good question, though. There was an article about uh, the hog market, I think, in the, was it Friday's Wall Street? I saw it the other day. Yeah. Anybody trading hogs? No? Not an exciting market? Um, I'm going to talk about cattle in a few minutes. But. So um, I mentioned the fact that it's difficult sometimes to assess whether what the government is saying is, is really the case or not. Uh, there are a lot of private firms out there that will supply funda fundamental information. Um, and usually there you get what you pay for. Um, but it's also the case that sometimes we don't know exactly um, what is a fact. And i just give you this example from um, the oil market this summer. So this summer, there was tremendous focus on the oil market, the crude oil market. You probably noticed the price of gasoline has dropped at the pumps compared to the summer while the price of crude oil has came down, come down. We were really trying to determine over the course of the summer what was going to happen to the price of oil. A lot of it had to do with uncertainty in Iraq where the production was cut back dramatically. And there was some talk of uh, the US trying to rebuild that production stream, uh, OPEC responded and reduced its production, sent prices higher. So the market was jumping around a lot trying to assess the fundamentals. So here's some examples from uh, the headlines. And these were all taken from the Wall Street Journal. So uh, August 5th this summer, New York uh, oil prices surged past $32. Little downside scene. In other words, 
the indication was that the market is, is going through the roof based on what's going on in the Middle East. Um, August 8th, three days later, another headline, same newspaper, oil prices move lower, supply concerns linger. So completely different story three days later. Then we see August 10th, well, what's going on? Market's back up again. Rising crude oil futures rev up prices at the pump. So you're getting totally whipsawed around. August 18th, oil prices continue to rise. There were some problems in Nigeria. And then on the 20th, oil futures lower. The market shrugging off the situation in Iraq. And we're back on a lower trend. It turns out that the market has sort of drifted south since then. But this, hopefully, this illustrates um, the proposition that A, news coming into the market is somewhat random, right? One day it's bullish, the next day it's bearish. And B, that the market does respond to this very rapidly, just trying to assess the direction the market's heading. And the oil market is so heavily traded, it's, it's one of the more efficient markets. And it's one that does attract a lot of attention, a lot of speculation, and a lot of hedging interest. So this is not a, uh, a fickle market. So what I want to do is uh, just talk a little bit about uh, how a fundamentalist trades. But um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, because you've all studied economics. You know what economics is. You know what elasticities are. And, and basically, that's what a fundamentalist does. Uh, you need to acquire data on production, on stocks, on consumption, on government policy, on political factors, the weather. Any event that might affect your market, you must be current on. And you break that into a supply and demand information. So uh, in economics, we talk about elasticities. And these are critical for a fundamentalist, because if you're looking at a market shock, it basically we're trying to anticipate market shocks. A shock means there's a big change in supply, or perhaps a big change in demand. But if there is a big change in supply, what does that do to the price? Well, you know it will depend on how steep that demand curve is. If there's a big shock in the coffee market, well, it might just um, affect the price of coffee in a significant way. As this graph shows you, um, back here in 2002, this was a weather scare in Brazil. And the price of coffee went from you know, 60 cents to 75, 80 cents in a very short time period. So, if I asked you about the demand for coffee, um, can you tell me one word that might characterize the demand for coffee? You mentioned elasticities. The demand for coffee is what? Inelastic. Thank you. It's inelastic. They keep raising the price at the coffee house, but still buy it. It's very inelastic. So if there's a shock in that market because of a frost in Brazil, you see a, a, a very rapid movement in prices. And as a fundamentalist, you have to understand that market. If the, the demand was more elastic and it had greater number of substitutes, everybody says, well, tea is a substitute for coffee. but you talk to the true coffee drinkers, that just isn't true. If the price goes up, you don't substitute a way to tea. You keep buying your coffee. Let me give you another example here. Uh, this is from the markets currently. I'm going to the cattle market. There's the article on pork. Uh, here we go. This is 
live cattle. Guess the price of live cattle this uh, summer and fall. Does anybody know why the price went up as much as it did? They're sitting at below 70 cents from last September through to June. And then why did it spike up? Exactly. Uh, the U.S. does import a significant number of cattle from Canada. Now, at the, you know, at, as a percent of consumption, it's not that large, but at the margin, it's very significant. I think it's about 5% of our consumption is imported from Canada. Uh, back in June, right here, uh, they discovered one animal in Canada that had BSE, mad cow disease. That hit England a few years ago where they had to slaughter all the cattle. It hit Japan. They discovered one animal in Canada. And the U.S. exports beef to Japan. Uh, this became obviously a, an important issue. The, the politicians scurried for cover, and they closed down the border. They shut the border between Canada and the U.S. for, for cattle. Um, and Japan is still saying, if you open the border, you're not selling any beef to Japan. So even though they've only found one cow and they've been looking, they haven't discovered another case, and it's possible that this can randomly happen, the one in a million cattle. So. Um, Guess how the market reacted? There was a sharp increase in prices. We went from 70 cents to over a dollar. Tremendous increase, again, because the demand for beef is somewhat price inelastic. Okay, again, uh, there's, there are substitution possibilities. It turns out that, interestingly, this event has not had the same impact on pork prices. And you know, we hear that there's tremendous substitution between beef and pork. And so if the price of beef goes up so much, why don't you just eat pork instead? Well, there's a certain demand for beef that's pretty price inelastic. And uh, this is what's caused the price of beef to rise so rapidly this fall. Now, you can imagine as a fundamentalist, what sort of news events are you paying attention to today? What's, what do you suppose is going on in Canada right now? There's a hell of a lot of cheap beef, right? Um, and so if the Secretary of Agriculture tomorrow announced that the ban's lifted, what's going to happen to these contract prices? They're going to plunge rapidly. So believe me, the cattle traders are watching this very, very carefully. And it makes you wonder if this market just isn't overdone. And if it's not going to plunge as soon as, well, it will when, once the border is open. But it's a question of when is the border going to be open. And that's a political question mark from here on in. It's strictly political. It doesn't have much to do with, with science at this point. It has to do with the US being able to convince the Japanese that this is OK. And for Japan to say, fine, and then the US will open the borders to Canada. Because our Secretary of Agriculture, in fact, has said there's no health risk at this point going forward. The animal that was found never entered the food chain, so on and so forth. Turns out the Canadians are still eating beef like crazy because the price is so low. Um, it didn't, unlike in Europe, it didn't cut into consumption there uh, because they believe that they have a s very safe uh, system for containing incidents like this. So. Uh, there's an oversupply because they ex normally export about 60% of their production to the U.S., and uh, that's going nowhere. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I can get through this, but I'll, let me get started. And you should definitely read this in the book. This is an important uh, concept. Uh, I said I won't spend too much time on any one aspect of fundamental trading. Um, but we've been talking a lot about exchange rates this quarter because the market's been so active and uh, the dollar is uh, being talked down and it has dropped 
significantly against the euro and some other major currencies. Um, when it comes to exchange rates, uh, there's also a school of fundamental traders and a school of technical traders. We heard from some of the fundamentalists on the videotape uh, where they were explaining what factors affect exchange rates, such as uh, interest rates and monetary policy, economic growth, and so on. There's also a, an economic uh, theory uh, that was alluded to in the video uh, that basically says the price of a basket of goods, so you take a, an automobile, you know, you take a BMW, you take a steak dinner, uh, you take a nice uh, Italian suit and a nice Italian pair of shoes, you put together a basket of commodities. And whether you buy those goods in Europe or in the United States or in Japan, if the exchange rates were in equilibrium, it should cost you the same amount in each country after you've converted your currency to the foreign currency. In other words, uh, this says that there's a law of one price, and it's called the purchasing power parity theory of exchange rates. So if the exchange rates are in equilibrium, um, then if you travel abroad and you convert your currency into the foreign currency, then you should be able to buy the same goods you can at home, and the prices would be identical once you make the exchange rate. Now, on a, on a daily basis, that rarely happens, right? They're always out of whack to a certain extent, but it's just a question of how far currencies are out of line vis-a-vis -vis their purchasing power. And this helps understand fundamentals in the exchange rate market. If a currency is significantly undervalued according to its international purchasing power, then there will be strong pressures for that currency to rise. If it's strongly overvalued, then there will be market pressures for that currency to devalue. So a fundamentalist trading currencies will try and assess the purchasing power of uh, various exchange rates. And um, I'll talk on Wednesday about one example. Please read it in the book, and it has to do with simply uh, looking at the price of Big Macs in different countries of the world. That was also mentioned on the video. No, the transactions cost as soon as it's zero. <laughs>